So guys, if you've made it through our first two videos and you're sitting there saying, listen, I get it, ETFs are awesome, but I wanna go a little bit deeper and find kit companies, that's awesome. My path was exactly that. I used to be 100% ETFs, and then as time went on, I decided to get more involved with individual companies, and I took a little bit of money away from the ETFs solely over time until I was 100% stuck. So we're gonna go over in this video how to find and evaluate a stock using our eight pillar process, using research ideas, and also find it like culminating in using our stock analyzer tool on our software to do this. So first off, Mo, best way to find a stock. Make a list of companies that you know. Yeah. That's really how it goes when you first start out. As you get more advanced, you'll be able to run screeners and you'll kind of figure out, we're gonna go through different metrics and income on the income statement financials. But in the beginning, companies you know, that's the best way of going about it. So Peter Lynch always says, buy companies you know, and everybody exaggerates that to say, oh, I know this company, they're from by the stock. No, what he's saying is, if you understand a company, if you use them, if you like them, that's the starting point to say, listen, maybe this is an investment for me. Because if you're a user of the company's products or service, that's a great place to start to say, does this company have a competitive edge? Why am I using their product or service? It doesn't mean I like Tesla, therefore I just buy a Tesla and pencil stock. No, that's the worst idea ever. And that's what people miss. And Peter Lynch has been very clear about that as time goes on. So from there, you're going to make a list of the companies you know then you need to be able to find some important basic metrics. Now, here's something that's different for our channel than other people. We do not believe, personally, this is our process, in falling in love with the company's qualitative aspects, the things that make them a great company from a um, user experience or the kind of product. We believe in weeding out using numbers first. Here's, an, a prime, here's a very simple example. If you're looking for a house to live in, do you go look for the big mansion with the pool and all that? No, you sit there and say, show me something that's in my price range immediately. It's the same thing with stocks. Find things that make sense first financially. If it doesn't make sense, even though you love the company, there's still a place for that in our software. You can add it to our watch list. But the key there is to sit there and screen out with numbers first. Yep. There's a lot of people that go and they start getting into the nitty gritty of a company. Why do you need to know the nitty gritty of a company if the financials don't even make sense? All right, guys. So the first process then is to understand a few metrics that we like to screen by. First off, market cap. What is market cap? It's very simple. It's the number of shares outstanding times the share price. What that basically says is if you want to buy all the shares of the company that are out there, this is the amount of money you have to pay. That's it. Very simple. You want to own the entire company, every share out there, that's what you need to pay. The example company here is Microsoft. Yep. The current Microsoft, uh, Microsoft market cap is 2.6 trillion. The stock price is 350. So if you divide 2.6 trillion by 350, you get 7.44 billion, which is the number of shares outstanding. Awesome, very simple, okay? This is if you want to buy every single share on the market of that company, and you don't own 100% of the company, okay? Another one, PE ratio or price to free cash flow ratio. Now you've probably heard about PE ratio. Price to free cash flow isn't much different, but basically it takes the price of the company, it's either the market cap or the stock price, and divides it by the earnings, either per share or total earnings, just depending on which way you're looking at it. So if the price of the company is 100 and it earns $5 a share, the PE is 20. Now that same company has a market cap of 100 million, total and earns total of $5 million, guess what? They have the same PE ratio, no different. Now, the only difference between this and price to free cash flow is one is based on free cash flow. So what is free cash flow, Mo? The cash that comes into the business. Yep. And that's calculated very simply on our cash flow statement as cash from operations, less your capital expenditures. And we actually added a line in our software, if you want to pull on most screen here, that shows that number there. It's not there usually. It's not on any of the financial statements. We show it right there because we want to make it easy for you. It, over long periods of time, earnings and free cash flow should be very similar. If there's a big difference between the two, you want the cash flow being higher than the earnings. So the cash flow, it's hard to manipulate cash flow. It can be done, but earnings have SEC rules, accounting rules, IRS rules, all these different rules. And companies can get very, very tricky. If you look at the history of Enron, if you remember Enron from 20 years ago, Somebody looking at their earnings versus their cash flow would have immediately seen a big problem. There was a massive difference, like 20 or 30 times more earnings than cash flow. 
And that's absurd. There's a lot of value investors who'll sit there and say, I'm not looking at a company unless free cash flow is at least 80% of earnings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this might sound a little more complicated, but basically look at your cash flow as the money coming in after you've paid all your expenses at your house. You get revenue in, you get your income in, you pay all your expenses, your free cash flow is the money left over. For you, that's probably very similar to your, what would be a net earnings thing. What's your disposable income at the end of the day? But if you have a mortgage where you're paying down debt, that's how earnings and free cash flow can be different. Okay? Now, next metric. This is a very, very important metric for a lot of investors, a lot of big investors, but a lot enough people talk about it. Return on invested capital, ROIC. What does that mean? There are two ways to fund a business. Mo, what are they? You debt, can fund, debt and equity. Equity. Those are two ways to fund a business. You either can borrow the money or you can put your own money in or bring investors on. So how is this important? Well, let's put it this way. Let's say there's two companies out there and they're both exactly the same. They both make $100 a year. Great. And let's say they have the same amount of invested capital. They have the same amount of debt and equity combined. And let's say it's um, $200, total equity and debt combined. Now let's say this company makes 10% on that money and this company makes 20%. Uh, which one are you willing to pay a premium for, Mo? The one with 20%. Right, and here's why. There's $200 of equity in there. At 10% return, they get an extra $20 next year. Great, 120 bucks in, in, in profit now. But on this one, they get an extra $40, 140. And it keeps compounding on itself. Over long periods of time, like 10 years, this company will be making two and a half, three times more money than this one. That's why this number is very important. That's also an indication of a moat. Now, what's a moat? I'm sure you've heard of this from Warren Buffett. It's basically like a castle, right? A moat around a castle protects the castle. A moat for a business is a business that's very, very protected. For example, like Coca-Cola, right? If I gave you $400 billion today and said, go compete with Coke, how would you do it? <laughs> Not very well. No, you'd suck at it. That's a good <laughs> idea of a moat. If I just issued that check and said, here's $400 billion, Coke, I don't even know what Coke's market cap is, maybe it's 250. If I gave you Coke's market cap as a check and said, go compete with Coke, you'd probably fail even with that kind of money. ROIC is a pretty good way of looking in and seeing how management is too. Yes. How management is it investing their money? Are they doing dumb acquisitions here? Are they wasting money just to look active? Right, because if you have to borrow at 8%, and your returns on your investment are six, you're gonna lose money. You're gonna, you're gonna hurt shareholder value. So this is a very, very, very important metric here for a lot, if you wanna find companies that have long-term growth potential that can compound on itself. That's the kind of investor that Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are. That's the kind of investor I have now become. I just wanna find good companies that get a high rate of return on their money and invest in the business because even if they grow at low rates of revenue, they're gonna be able to compound and build higher, higher earnings and free cash flow on that money. And that's extremely, extremely important. All right, one final metric that I kind of use for myself as a big, big indicator is our long-term liabilities, the free cash flow. Debt works for a company the same way it works for you. If you and your neighbor are exactly the same people, exact same house, exact same car, exact same income, but suddenly he has a $10 million debt attached to him for whatever reason, who is more likely to have financial trouble? The neighbor. Clearly the neighbor. Same thing with a company. Now, what we've chosen to do is we like to focus on a reasonable metric of cash flow to debt. We want to sit there and say, hey, can they pay off their debt if they really just buckled down and said, listen, we need to pay off the debt? Some companies have 20 times their free cash flow as debt. So if they make a dollar and a billion dollars in free cash flow, they have $20 billion in debt. That means it would take 20 years of that free cash flow to pay it off. Our goal is to have it to be less than five. Now, it doesn't mean you should only step by companies that are five. As a company has a higher moat and more consistent earnings and profit, you can pay a higher multiple. But we want this to be less than five times their average free cash flow over the last five years. To us, debt is an important aspect because when times are tough, that's when debt has its bank covenants, which means the bank sits there and say, hey, you're, hey your revenue and profit are down. We're calling your note. You got to pay us off right now. That's what causes financial problems. And that's what we want to avoid. Staying in the game is the most important part of investing. You want to be able to stay in the game for long periods of time. And if you're able to do that, a big metric would be debt. Now look at a company like, what we looked at the other day, it was AT&T. Yeah. AT&T has a market cap of $100 billion and debt of $200 billion, $300 billion on top of that. Wow. 
Yep, right here. That means 1% change in their interest rate on average would be $3 billion a year in lost cash flow. Just a 1% difference. That can cause problems. And when you're starting to liquidate assets, that's not a good thing. So debt's an important factor. So those are the four things we want you to just high level understand. Market cap, PE and price of free cash flow, return on invested capital, and some sort of metric on the debt and cash flow. All right? So the good news for you guys is our software right here is built to exactly screen for those metrics. So Mo's going to show you how he's going to put that in the software to start screening for these metrics so it can give you a list of the companies that matter to you. So what do you want to do for market cap? Well, for our channel, yep. we like to stay at over $2 billion. Okay. So do $2 billion and above. So let's say greater than $2 billion here. That's in there. Next. The next one is a price to free cash flow or PE ratio. Let's do. And let's, would you want to do a five year PE or a one year PE? Uh, let's do a five year PE. Okay. So our metric is always, we want it to be less than 22.5. Okay. Now let's just make it less than 20. Okay. Let's do less than 20. Okay, let's go back. And the great thing is you can change this to anything you want. Because I look at it going, let's go find some deals that are pretty good. Yep. Okay. All right. Return on invested capital. Five year. Now the market. Yeah. Uh, yes. The market average is nine to ten percent, but we want to get better companies. Let's go with your twelve percent idea. Okay. Great. And by the way, as example, Apple's is like thirty eight percent, which is an absurd number. So our final one, Mo, is the long term liabilities divided by five year free cash flow. Um, let's do less than eight. Okay. Because even though five is our original number. Uh, we want to get some uh, some higher quality businesses do justify a higher metric. Right. So now he hits the search button and look what happens, guys. There are 88 symbols that come out and it's just going to list all of them for you and the metrics attached to yep. them. And there are some big names here. Cisco, Philip Morris, Qualcomm, Amgen, Lockheed Martin, uh, Regeneron, um, GlaxoSmithKline. Target. Target. 3M. 3M DR Horton. T. Rowe Price, Price, eBay. eBay. These are names that you know. Yep. And that's the thing that like we talk about most first comment of saying, by names you know. So you can go in here and go, oh, I know them. I know them. I know them. The biggest thing, guys, I want you to remember, and this is a very important part, don't fall in love with the company. Right. This is why the software is so good. It gives you 88 options to look at. Don't get attached to a specific name and go, I love this name. Because you'll find yourself justifying the price no matter what the price is at. So if you look at 88 options, you're going to look at, start looking at them the way you should, which is as numbers. In the movie Moneyball, Jonah Hill is talking to Brad Pitt in the parking garage when Brad Pitt first confronts him. And Jonah Hill says something amazing. Because this movie is a lot about investing. He says, owners and GMs look at, player, look at getting players as buying a person. They shouldn't look at it. They should look at it as buying runs. And how do you buy runs? You buy hits. How do you buy return? You buy cash flow. You buy revenue. You buy these metrics. Now, does that mean you shouldn't care about the company? No, absolutely not. You still want to be able to find good companies. But your first goal should be, how do I buy the best companies for the least amount of money? That is the goal. How do you buy the most consistent cash? That's why a portfolio of 20 or 30 companies could be perfect for you because you might sit there and say, you know what? Some of them might do greater than others. Some might, I just don't understand this one. Focus on the metrics. If you focus on the metrics, you'll probably do pretty well. And that's a big focus. So don't fall in love with individual names. If you love Apple, I almost feel like stay away from Apple. Mm -hmm. Don't even look at it because you're just going to convince yourself to buy it. That's it. If you love Tesla as a car, you're just going to convince yourself to buy it. Look at it as buying cash flow, buying earnings, buying a balance sheet. That's the way I want you to frame your mind. You're buying a future stream of cash flow. Now, guys, as you find these companies, it doesn't mean just go, oh, these are 88 companies that work. Let me go buy them. No. Next, you want to start looking at their different financial statements. So I'm pulling up Microsoft here. Guys, there are three major financial statements. The income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. Here's what each one does. The income statement's where you go find the revenue coming in, the expenses attached to the business, the profit of the business, and then at the very, very bottom, shares outstanding. But it's basically showing, hey, on a year-to-year -year basis, how much money they bring into the company, their gross profit, which means on every extra unit they sell, how much money do they make as a percentage, and then all of their SG&A expenses, sales, general administrative expenses, research and development, all interest costs, and then at the bottom here, their net income. What's left over at the end of the day? And that's why we have the statement here showing 10 years so you can see trends. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon in our software, guys, you're going to be able to click 
a button that'll give you a percentage. All of these is a percentage of the revenue. That way you can see, are the percentages changing? Are they getting more efficient, less efficient? Where are their big increases, et cetera, okay? Second one, balance sheet. Guys, the balance sheet's a snapshot of the business. Right now, how much money do they have? What are their assets like? What's assets? Assets are things like cash, inventory, property, plant, and equipment, things that are tangible in there that they can go buy and sell, that they own. And then you have the liabilities of the balance sheet. Those are the things they owe. Who do they owe money to? Long-term debt, short-term debt, current payables, et cetera. Long-term payables, et cetera. And on a balance sheet, assets minus liabilities is your equity, right? So if you have $100 billion in assets and $30 billion in, um, in liabilities, you have $70 billion in equity. That's only book equity. That doesn't mean the company's value. It just means the assets minus the liabilities. So that's an important part. I don't, I focus on equity only on the nitty gritty detail. What I want to make sure of on the, on the balance sheet is I look at total current assets, which is basically cash on hand and their current liabilities. What money do they owe right now? And I want to make sure that's bigger. The current assets are bigger than the current liabilities. Can they pay them off right now? Because a lot of businesses like in the food business, it's negative. They owe more money now than they have cash on hand. Don't like that very much. But for like 70% of companies out there, usually the current assets are greater than the current liabilities. And that's a great thing, okay? The final one is the cash flow statement. Your favorite statement. That's the one we go to. Cash flow statement converts all the net income into actually what's the cash coming into the business. And free cash flow is your cash from operations less your capital expenditures. And what are your capital expenditures? That's the money that you invest into your property, plant, and equipment. So for you at home, if you sat there and put a new roof on your house, put a new kitchen in, those are capital expenditures. Those are things that can last a long time and increase the value of your property, okay? Something like changing the shower head because your shower head's broken, that's not a capital expenditure. That's a small thing. It's normal, it's small, everyday maintenance kind of item. But a big project like adding a deck or adding extension to your house, that's a buying cars, that's a capital expenditure. Buying buildings, those are capital expenditures. You wanna look at the free cash flow because you wanna make sure that the capital expenditures aren't so much that you're left with nothing at the end of the day. There are a lot of businesses that have a lot of capital expenditures. Those are capital intensive businesses. Those are hard businesses to make money at because they always have to reinvest more money to get that, to maintain their business. Right. That's not a good thing. Once Mo and I started to understand the cash flow statement, it's an importance, it made investing a lot easier because we're just like, oh, great. This is the cash left over every year. And again, we have 10 years. Right. So we can see the growth level. And this is a company like Microsoft. This is Microsoft. As you can see, it's growing and growing and growing and has had a dip. But the point is, it's a growing free cash flow business. And we love that. All right, guys. Now, we have what's called the eight pillar process, which Mo is going to go over right now. It's our method of screening. It's not a way of saying, oh, these are all check marks. Go buy it. It's telling you a story that allows you to go research things later. Mo, go ahead. As we ran the screener earlier, you can see on my screen that the screener that we ran with you guys, having the market cap, having the, the five-year debt situation, the ROIC, the PE, you can create that yourself, but we have our own. We have the eight pillars. So you can see that we have five-year PE less than 22 and a half, five-year ROIC greater than nine, shares outstanding. All of these things put together just tell a story. And like Paul just said, if all of these were green check marks, it doesn't mean just go buy it. If all of these are red X's, it doesn't mean that you just completely move on. They just begin to tell this story. And from here, we make the decision. So now at this point, we've looked at all the numbers. We've looked at the high level numbers of this. Now is the situation where we transition and we go, okay, things are starting to make sense for us. Maybe we really like Microsoft, but we need to figure out, is $350 a share the right, place, the right price to pay for Microsoft? So the story is being put together. Now we go figure out that price to pay, and then we go a little bit deeper. So now, guys, you've done a lot here. You've learned a lot here. Please rewatch the video. But now is the next step, which is what price to pay for the company. Now, on our stock analyzer tool, the reason we created it was we want to be able to take our assumptions about the future and just present value them, take them to today and say, what price do I need to pay to get the return I need to feel comfortable making this investment? That's the important part about the stock analyzer tool. And that's why as you're using it, make sure that you're very, very focused on understanding the inputs. And that's why we have a lot of conversations in our community about that. Because 
people take screenshots all the time and say, Paul, what do you think of my assumptions? And sometimes I'm like, oh, those, are, and you should watch our videos of Mo and I. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Mo will say something, I'm like, bro, that's way low. Or something I'm like, oh my God, that's really high. We, we differ all the time. That's part of the art of investing. That's the issue here. So with Stock Analyzer tool, it allows us to make assumptions based on revenue growth, profit margin, the free cash flow margin, what PE we think the company will sell at in the future, same with free cash flow. And finally, what's our desired annual return? The desired annual return is essentially your margin of safety. You can get nine or 10% from investing in the market. So for a margin of safety, you need a higher return. Right, Mo? Mm -hmm. The higher your return, the lower price you pay. Yep. If this phone's worth a thousand bucks, you're going to make a higher return paying a hundred dollars for it versus paying $900 for it. So when you want a higher margin of safety, you put a higher return as time goes on. And you're also making higher assumptions. Right. That's the key here for the software. That's the reason why when we're analyzing companies. We will make wide ranges here on low, middle, and high. And it's funny to see Mo and I, sometimes Mo will sit there and text me and go, hey, have you looked at Microsoft? And I'm like, no, I haven't. He's like, run it through your stock analyzers. Let me know what you get. And we'll take screenshots and send it to each other and go, oh, I like what you did there. And now you're probably right here. And you'll see me say that. Sometimes I'll be like, oh, Mo, you know, I put this in here, but I think you're right. I think it's actually a better number to do this. And something about stock analyzer, if this is your first time seeing it, do not be overwhelmed. This is something that you are going to get better at with practice. Literally every single user we've had has been overwhelmed when they first start. 100%. But they start using it and it gets better. And that's the key to it. So with a company like Microsoft, we would make, we always put the one, five and 10 year numbers here too, just to give you an idea. Now remember, just a guide. A company like Microsoft is so big, they're probably not gonna grow at the same rate they did in the past. Could they? Absolutely. But is it more likely? Probably not. Right. Probably more likely they slow down their growth. Right. So let's look at Microsoft. Let's do an example here just so we can show you guys what this does. So Mo, give me some revenue growth assumptions for the next 10. Oh, by the way, with, with Stock Analyzer, you can do one to 20 years of analysis. We're going to do 10 here. So Mo, give me some revenue growth numbers. I was thinking six, nine, and 12. Okay. I like it. Now profit margin. In the last 10 years, they did 28.8%. The last five years, 33.9%. So it looks like their margin is getting better. Mm -hmm. especially with Office 365 and much higher margin there. So Mo, what kind of margins are you going to put in here? Why don't we do 30? Okay. 32 and 34. I like it. So um, on this free cash flow, as we can see, guys, it's actually in the last five years been a little bit lower than the profit margin. So you want to sit there and, you know, look at these numbers and say, okay, what are my reasonable assumptions? It's also been very consistent. Right. 30, 30.7, a little bit of a dip. So. Um, how about 27? Okay. 29 and 31. Okay. So personally, I disagree with Mo on this one. Okay. I personally believe I'm probably doing 29 as my low. Okay. Because it's been very focused and I believe free cash flow will end up matching, matching profit margin here. So there's a lot of instances where we actually make free cash flow margin and profit margin the same. Yes. Because they should level out over a long uh, period of time. Especially, and over the last 10 years, yeah. it has been pretty similar. Right, right. Okay. I'm okay if you want to change that. Okay. Let's, let's change it to... 29, let's go 29, 30.5 and 32. Okay. You guys can see, the, you can play with these numbers. Yes. Once, one, do the stock analyzer one time and then be like, you know what? I didn't like that. Let me go back and change this. Yeah, but don't change it in order to get yourself the answer you want. Don't get, exactly. <laughs> now for PE and price of free cash flow, you, you're trying to guess where it's going to sell for in the future over long periods of time. Now remember, the historical average for stocks is 15 or 16. So to me, that's where you start. And from there, as the company has a high moat and a high art return on invested capital and higher growth rates, you go up and the exact opposite. If they have low return on invested capital, bad moat and lower growth rates, you decrease from there. I think, I think Mo, would you not agree that Microsoft's a high ROIC business yep. with a big moat yep. and a pretty decent growth rate yep. and stable company. So what kind of PE are you putting? I think I'm going to go 15, 17, and 19. Okay. A little bit lower than I would have done. I would have been, I, I would have been fine 16, 18, and 20 also. Let's do that then. Okay. Because I agree with that Perfectly fine more. With that. I actually think Microsoft deserves a premium. <clears throat> and uh, you can even justify a higher P. The, the point is, this is the subject. To, this is the art of investing. We don't know what the market will be in 10 years. What if the whole market is all of a sudden selling for 10 times earnings? This is going to be a lot lower. Right. But over long periods of time, it should average, the market should average 15 or 16. Now, finally, the desire return with margin of safety. Again, you can get nine or 10% by owning an ETF. So the question becomes, you've already beat up the company here. Yeah. 
So do you really need to beat it up again on a high return? Especially no. for a company as big as Microsoft? Not for me. So what, what return do you want to put in I here? I would put 10% return Okay. There. By the way, we know some people would put 7.5% or 8% saying, mm -hmm. I already beat this thing up. And if I can beat up Microsoft and still make 7.5%, I'm good with that. Yep. And that's, that's part of your determination of what you want. Now, what about the middle assumption? As we go higher in our assumptions, we need a higher margin of safety. Yep. I think I would go 12 Great. and 14% on the high end. I agree. Again, the chance of this happening is a lower than the chance of this happening. So we want to sit there and give ourselves a little bit of margin of safety here. Now, all we're going to do is hit the analyze button and let me explain the numbers that are going to pop up here. So these are the three values based on earnings. These are the three values based on free cash flow. We have prices of 150 to 155 on the low side, 220 to 230 on the high side, and 180 to 190 in the middle. Now remember, whatever price it's at, guys, you can hit the check mark and add it to your watch list and even edit that price. So you just edit it, notify me, boom, done. Now it's on your watch list. And if you have the phone app, it'll text, it'll message you there. It'll send you an email and it'll notify you on the software here on your desktop when the stock prices hit that. Now our last number here is very simple. The current price is 350. This last number says, listen, if you pay today's current price and the low assumptions occur, you're gonna lose about 0.7% a year. If you pay today's price and the middle assumptions occur, you're gonna make about 3.7. Over the next decade. Over the next decade, sorry. And if you pay today's price and the high assumptions occur, 8%. So what this tells me about Microsoft is, am I okay making 8% assuming the best of the best happen? For me, it's a no. So I'd rather just wait. So I add it to my watch list, it's at 190. And when it gets there, I have, I have a decision to make. This is the prime example we talked about before. It's too far from 190, so I don't need to do more research. I don't need to go do the, the, the 10 Ks and the things we're going to talk about here on what you do once you find a company that's at your mark. So guys, a lot of stuff going on here. That's awesome. That's great. Digest this. Once you've digested this and feel like you have a good understanding of it, you need to watch the next video. That's where we go into more detail on how you do deeper, deeper research in companies. And guys, the depth of research is up to you. Whatever feels most comfortable for you. I think personally, this is my personal opinion, don't hold me to this, if you just focus on the things we just did here, you'll probably do pretty well. As long as you stick to large, large companies. The smaller and smaller the company, the more due diligence, the more research you need to do. So please watch the next video if you're desirous to make really great returns, outsized returns, because you have to do a little bit more work. But that work will yield you bigger results. And that's the key there. So guys, please watch this next video.